well, everybody. Come on in. Come on in. It's great. Huh. Hold on a second. <laughs> Whew. Don't need that bad boy. Thank goodness for that. It's great to have you with us for the program today. We've got a great one in store. We've got some great worship coming up from Dave and Amy Howard. And you can sing along from the comfort of your own home or wherever you are. We also have a great sermon coming up from Priscilla and Aaliyah. And look, I'm even dressed for church today. And as I was saying, I'm even dressed for church today. So maybe you want to get dressed up too. Feel like you're at church, but you're actually at home. So sit back, relax. Well, good morning to everybody there um, watching church today in their homes. I know we're all stuck in our homes, unfortunately, um, and we would like to invite you into our house. Uh, we're standing here in our front room, as the English would call it, and uh, we wanted to share a couple of worship songs with you, and we really hope that you can sing along. Um, these are a couple of our favourites at the moment. Um, special songs to Amy and I. This first one's called Whole Heart. And it's really about how Jesus has done everything for us and, uh, yeah, wants to make our hearts whole again. Yeah. 
right at the moment um, you know the Bible several times gives a picture of um, God on his throne we have Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah is just in awe and uh, basically just bows down and feels like he shouldn't be there and it says the train of God's robe fills the temple uh, and there's another one in ja Daniel chapter 7 there's also another beautiful one in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 about God sitting on his throne and um, it's a beautiful image I think especially in tough times um, that God is there in control and, and reigning um, brings me a lot of comfort I know just to sing about and to think one day we'll stand before him and that's sort of what this song gets at so if you can sing along please do um, yeah this is not just a song for us to sing but for you as well
singing along. So kids, if you want to jump up, sing along and do some actions, please do um, and just have some fun and sing along and adults and parents too, more than welcome to sing along as well. Do you have a place at home that you go and sit or stand or lie in that makes you feel better that you pray or sleep? Well, this is the place for me. Sitting in this little hammock, this is the place where I think, I process, sometimes fall asleep, pray. Today I want to pray 
for everybody at home. I want to pray that you guys are safe and well and that you're looking after yourself. We all miss each other and I really do look forward to the day when I can actually serve you a coffee again and have a chat and maybe actually a little hug. But until then, let's stay strong, let's continue to chat and let's find a space in our home that we can connect with God, rejuvenate our bodies and just have a bit of a ponder about what life is all about. Uh, love you guys. Amen. This artwork is in the permanent collection of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. The artist Jean Appleton talked about two different accounts of the great catch of fish in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of John. And she says, the dramatic beauty of the one in Luke with the breaking of the nets and the sinking ships seemed to have a sort of tension and richness which, to me, at that moment anyway, had to be expressed in paint. Look at the lines and colours. Do you like it? Is it beautiful to you? What words would you use to describe it? How would you describe it to someone who has never seen it? I want you to look at the painting, but now I want you to close your eyes for a few seconds. Go on, close them. And I just want you to imagine the painting in your mind. Remember it. Keep your eyes closed. Now I want you to open your eyes and look at the painting again. Was the picture in your memory right? Had you really been looking, or do you think maybe you missed something? And can you notice new things about it now? Which parts grab your attention now? Does your opinion change the longer you look at it? I thought it was drab at first, but now the blue parts, they really sing and they're really vibrant, especially that bit on the right where the blue kind of swooshes up over into the boats and the nets. Look at how it seeps into every crevice. And those fish, patches of colour really, it's like they're warm and energetic amongst the rest of the cool colours on the canvas. And now I really notice the splashy white bits. It feels a bit chaotic. I imagine that oh, if I was standing in that painting, in that moment, I would probably be quite unsteady on my feet. Can't quite tell what parts of the net, what part is the boat. I think that's how I would feel if I was really there. A rush of net and boat and fish and water. And, and if I was there and everything was breaking and sinking and swarming around my feet, knocking me off balance, I'd probably have to look up to where there was space and calm. See that calm spot right in the top right of the painting where it opens up? I like that bit. Hey friends, who would have thought that this is how we were going to hang out today? But nonetheless, the spirit is here and I'm excited to share some thoughts with you this morning. So about a year after I was born, my grandfather moved from Sydney where we were up to Noosa in Queensland. And we didn't have a lot to do with each other because of the distance. We saw him probably once a year or so. Um, so the times that we were there, we really made an effort to bond. And on this particular visit, I was about nine or ten years old, he decided to take us fishing. Now, I was all in just to bond with my grandfather, not a big fan of fishing and hadn't really had much experience in it, to be really honest. We went out to the beach one day and he gave it a go, my dad gave it a go, I think my step-grandmother gave it a go as well, and none of them could really do it. And then I wanted to have a try. So he taught me how to do it. We threw the line into the water and then he said, you just got to wait. And I was like, like, how long? He's like, you just wait. And I was like, oh, okay. I don't know if I was a normal nine or 10 year old, but waiting was not a super fun thing to do. So we did wait. And then all of a sudden there was a tug on the line and lo and behold, I had caught a fish. The only catch of the day, so I was very impressed with myself. So we pulled out the fish, it was just a small fish, and that became part of our dinner that night. 
I was pretty stoked and it definitely is a memory in my mind that bonded me to my grandfather and probably the only experience I've really had with fishing. I may not be an expert fisherman, but I do know some who are. I'm currently studying through the book of Luke. Wow, what a book. And when I read or study through scripture, I'm, I'm often drawn to a particular story or a character. And in this case, I was drawn to seven seemingly insignificant words. Found in Luke 5, at the end of verse 2, it says, The fishermen who are washing their nets. The story is about Jesus calling his first disciples. It's a familiar story. Yet the fact that the disciples were washing their nets is what piqued my interest. They had been fishing all night without success, and Jesus tells them to try again, this time in the daylight. Now, fishermen generally fished at night, but they obeyed Jesus. They caught so many fish that they needed two boats to hold all the fish that they had caught, and the nets began to break in the process because of the amazing miracle that had just happened. I began to search what nets meant in the Bible and a lot of the time in the Old Testament it signifies a sense of entrapment to the wicked and the unrighteous. But for the fishermen the net was so important. It was their tool, it was their livelihood, it was everything to them. When it comes to the net there are four things that I noticed and I drew out and the first of that is the washing of the net. You might ask, why does a net need to be washed when it's often in the water? Well, good question. That's what I thought. Well, they would catch debris and all kinds of things from the sea other than fish that needed washing to get rid of it from the net. And many people talk about the discouragement that the disciples would have felt when they wanted to give up. Yeah, for sure. But if they were giving up, they wouldn't be washing their nets. The disciples were washing their nets because there was an intention to use the net again. Also, it was the fishermen washing the net, plural, meaning that it takes more than one to wash the net. Sometimes the act of washing a net is not meant to be done alone. Secondly, mending the net. Fishermen mend their nets because they are preparing for their next expedition. Not a Pathfinder expedition, but their next outing or mission, the next time that they're going out to fish. Mending a net takes time, it takes practice, and there's an art to it. I was reading an article this week about mending nets, and it said that even though there's amazing technology available these days, doesn't matter what net you have, whether it's a casting, gill or dip net. Do I sound like I know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and no matter the size of the hole, mending still takes place by hand. There's an art to it. It takes practice. Thirdly, hanging the net to dry. Or how I like to see it, the net needs to be rested. Wash the net, mend the net, hang the net to dry. And finally is the act of casting the net. Casting a net begins with the action of fishing. And in the original language, it gives us deeper meaning into this word, cast. It means to arise, to send, and to throw. These disciples were in the habit of doing all of this in order for their fishing to be the best that it could be. This process was important because their net was their tool. It was their livelihood. It was everything. This made me think about the importance of a tool, how we see our tool. I was fleshing this thought out with Zane, as I do, often when I read something or I've been thinking about something and I was thinking about what this means. And here is what I want to leave with you. Washing, mending, hanging it to dry for its own longevity, casting. Well, what if you were God's net? What if you were the tool that God uses to fish for his kingdom? You and I, what if we get to be that? You are so important to him. You are his tool, you are his livelihood, you are his everything. 
in the hands of the master fisherman. He is the one who can wash you. He can get rid of the debris and the other things that have been caught up unnecessarily. He is the one that can wash you with the sweet aromas and perfumes of heaven. He will wash you with peace and courage and assurance to know that you are his child and he is the one that is bathing you clean. He will wash away your imperfections, your hurt, your pain, your fears. I had a crippling fear of crocodiles. I know, random. I'll tell you the story another time. But Jesus washed me clean of it. And in Ezekiel 36, 25, it says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. He can mend you. He will bind your wounds and do it by hand. He will sit and listen to your cries. He will take the time to breathe life into your broken heart. My heart was broken when I was 19, totally shattered. But over time, Jesus completely mended my heart and I am forever grateful. No matter how big the hole is in your life, he will, by his own hands, mend you. Psalm 147.3 says he heals the wounds of every shattered heart. He will allow you to dry, aka rest. He will cause you to rest because you are so important to Jesus, our master fisherman, that he has created one day in seven to rest, to dry, to replenish. This year I began to study the Sabbath and wow, has it ignited a passion and a quest for what the Sabbath is and what it looks like in our family. Now, Friday night is our highlight of the week. We look forward to it every week and come sunset, we light two candles and our boy Hunter goes and does it with us and he calls the first one cease. Cease from work, from hurry, from toil. And the second candle is celebrate. Celebrate this moment of rest. In Hebrews 4 verses 9 to 11 it says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore, listen to this, make every effort to enter that rest. Make every effort to enter that rest. He can wash you. He can mend you. He has provided a way for us to dry and rest. And then because of the washing and the mending and the resting, if you let him, he will cast you. He will say, arise. He will send you. Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I certainly have gone through my process of washing and mending and drying. And then he cast me. I remember the time when he when God mobilized and cast me into this new world of chaplaincy in his sweet, beautiful time. Take the pressure off yourself to be the fisherman. If God casts you, remember, God cast you. It's not up to you to figure it all out. He cast you. So he's going to be the one to equip you, to empower you, to strengthen you. Stop trying to wash yourself to mend yourself, to hang yourself out to dry, and then potentially creating your own thing that you're casting yourself into. Let Jesus, the master fisherman, be the one that looks after you as his precious net. And when he sees the time is right, just like he did with the disciples, even though it was daylight and not the normal time to go out fishing, when he sees that the time is right, he will cast you and you will need more boats to catch a hold of the miracle that Jesus will do. I pray that we become a strong and faithful net ready for the master fisherman to cast. The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
This painting, a portrait of Eileen Kramer by Andrew Lloyd Greensmith, was a finalist in the 2017 Archibald Painting Prize. It's not the first time or last time Eileen has been painted. She was born in 1914 and is now 106 years old and she is a dancer. She's been dancing since the 1940s. In 2017, at 102 years of age, she produced her own dance drama production. I've seen several portraits of Eileen, beautiful paintings, photographs. There have been television programs and film features and books published about her. She has worked and performed all over the world and has never stopped in all sorts of creative pursuits. She's even painted Parisian murals in Pakistan, designed coats and created fashion shows. According to news articles, she doesn't like to talk about her age. She wants to talk about her work, dancing, life, beauty, expression, the things that matter to her most. She says, what interests me is that my spirit is still at work. What an extraordinary woman with remarkable life experiences and stories to tell. What would you ask this woman if you met her? I would like to ask her about all of her creative projects and where she gets her inspiration. I would like to ask her what she thinks about our government and ask her what she thinks is the most important thing for kids to learn. I'd like to ask her how she's seen changes to how women are valued and treated over her lifetime. I'd ask her what it was like to live through wars and the Great Depression. I'm so glad that this woman's story is being told and that I got to meet her through this painting. Her story will live on forever in books and paintings and films. This painting reminds me that women truly are remarkable and their stories and experiences should be celebrated and I need to look around more closely at the women's stories in my world. If we're looking at the book of Luke, one thing that I really love to see is that women are involved in the story. And I know the other Gospels mention women, but I think Luke does it in a way where he highlights their significance and their role in Jesus' ministry. And so I took a bit of a deep dive and I looked at all the, diff all the stories in Luke about women in different translations and I read articles about the cultural context and I listened to podcasts just so I could understand more and that I could learn more about the role of women in society of the time but also in these stories. And so there's a couple of women I want to look at but first I want to go look at Anna. So Okay, so if we're starting with Anna, let's head over to Luke chapter 2. And in this chapter, we see this pairing kind of thing that Luke does, where he has a story of a woman and then pairs it with a man. So he starts off with the prophecy of Simeon. And it says that the Holy Spirit um, revealed to him that he would not die until he met baby Jesus. And so he's at the temple and he sees Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. And he knew it was the Messiah instantly. Anyway, if we jump down to verse 36, it's the prophecy of Anna. And it says, Anna was a prophet who was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Her husband died when she had, they had been married only seven years. She lived a widow to the age of 84 and she never left the temple, but stayed there day and night worshipping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who'd been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. And so my favourite part of that is that she's a prophetess and she's devoted her whole life to being at the temple and she's fasting and praying and she's just a woman who's really in touch with God. And so she sees baby Jesus and she knows instantly he's the Messiah. And she starts praising him and blessing him and his parents and Anna and Simeon must have been so in touch with the scriptures because both of them worked out really fast that this baby Jesus, yeah, he's the Messiah. He's the one who's going to um, set free Israel. I mean, Jerusalem. And so verse 38, it says, it, 
Um, she talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to re resume, rescue Jerusalem. And I read that and I read that as, so there's this, these people around who kind of don't really know what's going on and she teaches them and she preaches to them and she's talking and they've listened and they've learned. Um, and I think, I think the fact that she's a prophetess in that day and age is just incredible. Um, especially when back then they debated whether women should even be um, learning and reading the scriptures. Anyway, so Anna, this killer prophetess, recognizes Jesus as the Messiah instantly. And she preached and they listened. Well, that's cool. So that's one story about a woman, but surely there can't be more. Well, you're wrong. If we jump over to Luke chapter 8, it's just three verses, but these three verses are really crucial. Okay, so the start of chapter 8. I'm just going to paraphrase it. It's verses 1 to 3. It said, Jesus began a tour of a town, of a nearby town, preaching the good news, and he took his 12 disciples with him. And then verse 2 says, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others, who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. And I was looking at the different translations of this verse, and I came across the King James Version. And the last um, line of the last verse, it says, who ministered unto him of their own substance. I love the word ministered because in both translations, yeah, they were they were helping and they were giving, but they're also ministering in creating um, just the good news story. And these these women, they were disciples and they were servants of God and they were giving of the out of their own pockets to support the ministry and the mission. And I don't know how they could have been more committed. Um, yeah, it was just a really important story. But that's not the only time we see um, Mary Magdalene. We see her quite a bit in Luke. And another significant time we see her is the story in chapter 10, verse starts in verse 38, Jesus visits Mary and Martha. And so I think anyone with a sibling can relate to Mary and Martha. So the story goes in chapter 10. It starts, verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem and they came upon a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into their home. And then verse 39 goes on, her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Classic sibling move. You're doing what you're supposed to do. You're doing your work. And your siblings over here are slacking off. Like, I'd like to think I was Martha, you know, the one dedicated and doing all the work. But I know I'm more like Mary. Um, anyway, so I think it's really interesting that Martha goes to Jesus and she expects, she, she expects Jesus to be like, yeah, Mary, go, go do what you're supposed to do. Like, Go do your work. Um, but he doesn't. He flips it on his head. Um, and so he says, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being worried and concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. And his response is so crucial on so many levels. On one level... He's just been like, nah, stress less, Martha. Like, it's, it doesn't really matter. The dinner's like, it's going to happen anyway. It'll be all right. Like, doesn't no need to stress over it. But on another level, Jesus is also teaching Martha and teaching Martha that he doesn't care about the household duties as a host and he doesn't care about, like, in the culture that was their role to, like, be hospitable and prepare the dinner and so he lifted these gender restrictions that faced them and instead he talked with them and he discipled with them and he ministered to them because Jesus did value women in his ministry 
and he defied like social and cultural expectations of the time because he's teaching Martha that I want instead of you doing like your jobs that like don't really mean much he's teaching her to come over and sit at my feet and learn and learn about the good news story and let me minister you to you and teach you how to be a disciple um I think it's really crucial that Jesus really was like no I want you a part of my ministry I want you a part of my story and so come over and sit at my feet and learn and I think these stories in Luke um, really highlight the need for us to reread the Bible and reread it again and again until we've picked up all the minor details and the minorities that really add to the picture because I know rereading these stories throughout Luke I saw before I saw a beautiful picture of God and his um work but rereading these stories and finding out like the significance of the women in it just painted it so many more beautiful colors and just just enriched the story and so I know for me I think we need to um not just habitually skip over the minor details like the women or the children um because the bible is written by men so they're going to be um in the front and center of the story and so that's kind of my thought if you can reread a passage in the bible that you haven't read in a while and just try and pick out the the little things that you didn't really notice much it doesn't have to be something drastic but i pray that you can find something that just highlights the picture and adds a bit of extra color and just maybe magnifies how great his story is so i'm just gonna pray Hey God, um, thank you for these amazing women in your Bible, like Anna and like Mary and Martha. And please help us to live like Anna and be so devoted to your word and so connected to you. And please be with us as we go through the rest of the weekend and um, help us to find the little things rereading the Bible that just help magnify your greatness. In your name, amen. to have you with us for the program today. Make sure that you're checking up on your friends and your family while we're stuck in this lockdown. I hope you're all staying safe and you're doing well. Hopefully it's not for too much longer. But once again, it was great having you with us for the program today. Well, it's time to go. That's it. That's all. There ain't no more. We'll see you next time on September 11th for the next World Program. See you then.